what was different about crypto in particular was just how low the bar was, right? There were no designers at all. It didn't feel like anyone cared about actually translating what is like this really revolutionary and exciting technology into something that was actually like relevant. Uh, as I recall, it felt like almost sinful to build on anything other than Ethereum. That's still not still true. I mean, there's probably going to be in a debate forever about AMMs versus order books. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Ori and Utaro, uh, both really um, founders that are OG in the space. So I'm really looking forward to this podcast, uh, founders of Orca. Um, so I think this is really going to be a great conversation on the beginnings of uh, why, why Solana, why DeFi and Solana, uh, why they chose to make this kind of their home. And then some kind of diving into future products that they're going to announce. Um, so really looking forward to this podcast and excited to chat with both of you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks Perfect. for having us. Um, well, I, I would love, I mean, maybe just a quick intro on each of you, uh, if you could, and then jump into uh, Utara. I know you were previously at the ETH Foundation uh, so a little bit about why you decided to build on Solana at the point in time that you did, because I think at that point in time, uh, as I recall, it felt like almost sinful to build on anything other than Ethereum. And that's so, still, that's still true. <laughs> and so I, I would love from like your point of view, why you took the risk on kind of this new infrastructure, this new chain, um, and how the experience has been thus far. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, I mean, it's definitely interesting to hear someone say that I'm an OG because it feels like I just joined a few years ago. But um, I suppose that's a that's testament. That's crypto, man. Yeah, that's how that's how fast crypto moves. It does move um, quickly. Yeah, I mean, happy to talk about kind of our, our backgrounds. Um, you know, like you mentioned, I, I initially started off um, in the Ethereum world. It was around late 2017. I was looking for... I was basically looking for what is the most interesting thing going on in, in crypto. Initially, I thought it was kind of um, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Lightning Networks, because it, that had a lot of hype at the time. <clears throat> Started looking into it. It wasn't really clear how I could contribute. And then um, basically, uh, I was in Tokyo at the time, went to an ETH meetup met all the folks there. I was really inspired by them. Started looking into ETH2, which was just getting started at the time, started contributing, and then it kind of just snowballed from there. Um, ultimately, I decided I, I was a contributor for um, the the Golang uh, version of the ETH2 validator, um, which was with the folks at Prismatic Labs. Had a great time there, learned a lot. Um, and then you know, that kind of one thing went to another. I suppose I had also spent time on the application side, uh, building out a DeFi protocol called UMA um, with with Heart in New York. And that was also a great experience. And then I had also, after that, spent some time um, on kind of layer two prototyping. Um, you know, this is before kind of optimism was a thing um, when people were still kind of trying to figure out what is a uh, the ideal construction for these layer twos that people are just kind of only starting to theorize. Um, and then that was kind of like the prelude that led us to start working on Solana and seeing kind of the opportunity that Solana provided. Um, and happy to talk more about that later as well. Perfect. And Ori, I, yeah, I would love to like learn a little bit more about your backstory as well, like how you two came together and ultimately built what is now today Orca. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first, I'd say that I think Utaro really sells himself short uh, in terms of his background. You know, he's an industry trained software engineer by background originally, but just saw the potential in crypto. I think really early on was kind of like a geek for for math, for economics, for finance, and for cryptography. And you put all those things together, and you get crypto. And so he pretty much just like quit his job um, into a you know halfway into a promising career and decided to just study crypto full time, which is how he ended up at the, those meetups and ended up at the Ethereum Foundation. So that definitely gives us as a founding duo that crypto background. Whereas for me, I come from like the complete opposite of, I would say, extreme crypto skeptic, actually. Like spent pretty much most of my career until Orca uh, doing what I would say, I kind of fondly joke is like the goody two shoes thing, right? Like working in ed tech, uh, working on like nonprofit projects, uh, working on impact projects for IDEO. And then 
uh, pretty much also had a software background mixed with design. So went to Stanford, studied computer science, uh, studied human computer interaction, was just kind of out there trying to see how I could put things, those things together and ended up uh, specializing and really doing human centered design for highly technical systems and trying to apply that in whatever the most impactful way possible was. And so that's kind of how I ended up in Tokyo back in like 2018, 2019, working for, for IDEO Tokyo, doing projects, working across Asia. And it was during that time that I ended up actually like meeting Utaro. And this is pretty much just when COVID happened, um, pretty much like moved into a like co-living, co-working house for like, you know, entrepreneur type vibe. Um, wasn't really looking to, to start anything at the time, but just kind of we met pandemic happened, things locked down, everyone got kind of bored and we're like, I'm a builder, you're a builder, should we build something on the side? And, you know, before we knew it, suddenly I was like deep in the world of crypto. And I think that uh, combination of our skill sets and also of our interest ended up uh, allowing us to build something that was actually quite unique in that it really built on these deep crypto principles, but with, I think a little bit more soul and focus on user experience than the average product. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I got fairly familiar with uh, Orca and their product even prior to like the first Breakpoint event, but uh, I was lucky enough to uh, attend one of your events. I don't know if I was lucky enough to t uh, speak with both of you at the event, but got um, invited to event and just met the awesome team and was super inspired uh, what you were building. I think that first break point was really kind of a rallying point for the Solana community to meet everybody in person and um, get to chat with everybody. But I think one thing that really stood out to me was Orca's point of view on just making things much more simplistic than they have in the past. And Ori, I mean, touching upon um, studying design, studying uh, human interaction with the software. Could you touch upon that component as well? Because I feel like Orca really goes beyond, beyond the other AMMs in the space. It was never my intent to redesign crypto for people. Uh, I think it's just something that, again, naturally evolved. I think so much of our story is really organic in that way. It's just something I love about it. But yeah, I mean, I started out my career, like I mentioned, really as just a, you know, run of the mill software engineer, I would say. And it was actually after building lots of products over my time working at primarily startups that never really had product market fit uh, that caused me to get frustrated with that process and to really take a step back and say, okay, what is it that I want to work on? And I realized that what I wanted to work on was earlier in the funnel, making sure that the products that we were actually building were the right ones to actually solve problems for people. And when we came to crypto, I think that perspective was no different. I had a little more experience actually doing it. Uh, but what was different about crypto in particular was just how low the bar was, right? There were no designers at all. It didn't feel like anyone cared about actually translating what is like this really revolutionary and exciting technology into something that was actually like relevant and usable. And so I was like, okay, I'm not an expert on the tech, but this is where I can come in and provide some value. Definitely. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think, I mean, there are definitely today still exists a lot of technical challenges for the space, but I mean, it's been forefront from the beginning that design is something that always needs love and still needs much love. And so I, I think Orga really separates itself from the pack from that front. Uh, Utaro, I, I, I would love for you to go in a little bit more. I mean, just being involved with the, the Ethereum community, um, so heavily to share some of your insights on why both of you were kind of decided to build in the Solana ecosystem, which was new, um, kind of really untested at the time um, and early to this new ecosystem. Uh, what kind of brought you to or what technical things about the ecosystem uh, got you excited to build here? Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> I, I think um, kind of one one relevant article that's been making the rounds recently was, uh, I believe it was, it was an article called Rollups Aren't Real. Um, and, and it does a deep dive of kind of how rollups work and what are the different kind of trade-offs that one can make in order to create a more complete design. There is also, I believe, um, a talk maybe at ETH Denver by uh, Kelvin from Optimism yep. that I think it was called ZK Rollups Aren't Real. And yes. it kind of had a lot of the same themes. Um, you know, after reading that, I think for me, it actually kind of reminded me of like why, why for me, Solana 
makes a lot of sense and why it's clear that there is a place for Solana um, kind of in the crypto ecosystem. And in a nutshell, the way I would describe it um, <clears throat> is that kind of the, the mainline strategy for Ethereum for scaling and onboarding new users is kind of this like, uh, let's have an L1 that is incredibly stable, but is not high throughput. And then let's build these kind of like layer two constructions on top of it, whether it be optimistic rollups or ZK rollups. Um, and, and that is how we're kind of going to get to, you know, onboarding a billion users. And I think that there are a lot of good reasons for this design. Um, you know, one primarily is that it kind of, assuming that the Ethereum mainnet is stable, um, it, it provides kind of a solid foundation. But then it's also fairly clear once you really dig into kind of the the construction and kind of the weaknesses of the construction that um, it, it takes a very opinionated view of kind of different trade offs that can be made. And if you kind of look at the full range of trade offs that can be made for you know scaling um, a smart contract blockchain and you know hopefully onboarding more users, it's it's incredibly clear that there are a lot of other valid kind of routes that you can take in order to do this. And Solana is, I think, um, if you look at kind of the, the design of Solana, it's a very valid way of scaling kind of a blockchain. Um, it's also kind of difficult to kind of tease out the, the fundamentals from, from the narrative, of course. Like Solana at this point has a huge narrative problem. And then it also has like kind of real issues when it comes to the, the network halting how difficult it is to onboard users when you know there's there's kind of this real risk of the network halting um but then despite that when you kind of look at the fundamentals um it yeah it's basically kind of what uh what i've observed is that ethereum is like quite good at a lot of things but then you know when it comes to what is it not like incredibly good at well i would say that the EVM was kind of way ahead of its time, but it's also kind of a, a far from perfect virtual machine for processing kind of transactions. Um, and then the networking layer uh, also kind of like ahead of its time. But, you know, if you kind of consider what the state of the art is for um, um, kind of consensus protocols, it, it's clearly kind of not as good as, um, you know, it's 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 far from kind of like theoretically optimal. Um, yeah. And then when I see kind of Solana and the design and also the team and the experience that the team has, it kind of has a lot of these strengths that Ethereum doesn't have. Definitely. Now, I, I, I mean, prior to really me going full time in the space and kind of understanding the small nuances of the blockchain architecture, I would definitely paint myself squarely as an Ethereum maxi. And I think I definitely applaud Ethereum and all the research that I, I, you did and other people in the past. I think they've just ultimately have chosen for a different set of constraints, which I don't necessarily think is bad. Uh, but Solana has definitely taken a different approach. And by allowing kind of cheapest possible cost to users, high throughput, low latency, you're able to build much more interesting applications. Um, and so I applaud you and uh, the team for taking the bet on Solana early because um, I, I remember even talking about other layer ones was, uh, and let alone building on them, uh, must have been a hard choice at the time. So I, I guess like, I mean, be, specifically focus on DeFi, um, what, could you maybe both of you like just recant a little bit uh, more about the origin story and how uh, Orca ultimately came to be, um, why DeFi and ultimately how'd you get started with this AMM model? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess if we, we tell the full story, I, the two of us, again, we, we pretty much started by just like hacking on side projects purely for fun. Uh, we were building on Ethereum. Um, and, you know, I think at the time I joked that Utara was an ETH maxi, but to, coming in from the outside, I, I think the whole like this chain maxi, that chain maxi narrative is kind of defeats the purpose of like what we're all trying to do here. Um, you know, if I was looking at an analogy almost back from like engineering world, when I used to be a front end engineer, you would pick the best 
framework to build a particular application, right? And so back in the day, it was like jQuery. Um, and then we had Backbone. And then, you know, later on, we had React. And then we, there was, there's definitely some people who resisted moving over. But at the end of the day, you pick the, the right technology for the job. And most of the people will naturally migrate to the better technology. But like, what's different about crypto is that people have bags to shell and like bags to protect. And I think if people didn't have bags to protect, we'd be looking at a very different technological landscape. And maybe it's like an incendiary point of view, but coming in like as an outsider is like, why are people so concerned about this chain versus that chain as opposed to advancing, you know, what I think is like, we should all be smart contract maxis uh, and we should be like picking the technology that best allows us to advance that. Um, but in any case, we were like building these, these side projects. Um, we actually ended up like getting into this incubator, which was totally online run by Mozilla. And one of their focuses was crypto. And we were building out a little application um, on top of uh, Ethereum for that and actually did build out like a working MVP. It was sort of this like passive yield generation app. Um, it was very cute. We called it Wallaroo. People actually did have like a couple thousand dollars of deposits in our beta. Um, but that was pretty much when DeFi Summer was also blowing up. And, you know, I was at the time still very like starry eyed, like, let's help, you know, unbanked people in like developing countries use this app and they can deposit like $10 at a time as they get their, their paychecks. And I was like, okay, well, gas fees are like 50 bucks on Ethereum. Like, yeah. <laughs> this isn't going to work. And so I think this is when it, we took a step back and we're like, all right, well, if Ethereum is not going to scale, um, you know, just on its own, what will allow the dream of like smart contracts to scale? And I'd say that's the first step in what led us to Solana. Yeah. Um, another component of that is maybe this is not kind of a, um, an interesting story per se, but like quite simply, you know, I, I just love the AMM kind of design. It captures a lot of what makes crypto so interesting. Um, one of it is, you know, first of all, kind of the, the original Uniswap you know, B1 contract. It, it's so simple and it's it's shocking kind of like how, how few lines of code is uh, is involved in kind of the smart contract itself. Um, and then also the other thing I find particularly interesting about it is how kind of the conventional thinking originally at the time was to take the central limit order book and then try and shove that on chain. But then it turned out that, you know, the correct design was actually something that was like fairly radically different. And it just took such a long time for people to wrap their heads around it and understand why it worked. Um, and so kind of seeing, um, understanding that, you know, Solana is like fundamentally uh, taking a different set of trade-offs, but it is still a blockchain that is like running on a global set, uh, globally, globally distributed network of validators. It still has like these uh, constraints and kind of understanding that AMMs are ultimately still the right primitive, even for something like Solana. Um, I mean, that was, those are some of the big reasons why we decided to focus on AMMs first. Could you talk, I think right now, I mean, there's, probably going to be in a debate forever about AMMs versus order books. But could you speak specifically to the different like trade-offs that you think um, one or the other is making and specifically why you're kind of like doubling down on this like AMM uh, model? Yeah. So, you know, I, I would actually like, so one thing that I've been pushing is reframing the question and not, is it AMMs or clouds, but actually just understanding that, um, particularly concentrated liquidity AMMs um, are incredibly similar to clubs and fundamentally, you know, even for market makers, they can think of kind of the different, they, they can think of providing liquidity on a concentrated liquidity AMM as very similar to market making on a central limit order book. Um, however, there are kind of like fundamental differences. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to just focus on a concentrated liquidity AMM and a club. Um, one of the fundamental differences, and this is like, can be quite nuanced and in the weeds, is that um, as a market maker on a central limit order book, you set a limit order. If someone kind of fills that limit order, then the liquidity and the assets are taken off the order book. Um, in comparison, when you look at a concentrated liquidity AMM, a market maker, they provide liquidity within a tick. Um, once that order is filled, the the assets stay in the pool, right? It's just that they provide liquidity on the opposite side. And so that's kind of one fundamental difference. You know, atomically, kind of when a trade is executed in a central limit order book, 
liquidity is taken off the order book. It's concentrated liquidity AMMs. It stays in the order book atomically. That makes sense. I, I think, I mean, this topic will I, uh, probably be debated for a long time. And I, I think, like, your approach is, I mean very unique and you guys are approaching it from a novel way. And I think from the customer standpoint, it also provides a great experience. And so maybe like going a little bit deeper on like the technical nuance, is it on these like distributed systems of order books, is it specifically harder just because how many bids and asks ultimately get set for order books or again, like maybe just like going like one level deeper to try to like qual like any pushback that you would get from like uh, people from one architecture from another. Yeah, so I think um, I think part of it is the technical complexity of like having a fully on-chain order book. Um, you kind of mentioned that, and I think that's something that is hard to quantify. Quantify, but it, it does exist. I think another mm-hmm. factor that is under discussed is kind of. Um, essentially the benefit of making it more accessible to provide liquidity on an AMM. And the, and the reason for that kind of stems from what I said earlier about how like liquidity stays in the order book, um, or rather how liquidity stays in the pool for a concentrated liquidity AMM. Um, kind of that allows a, a market maker on a concentrated liquidity AMM to say, hey, I just want to provide liquidity within price range And then they're able to provide liquidity in a fairly efficient way. If they wanted to do that on an order book, they would have to basically create um, a bot, you know, and then run it on AWS. And even then, I think there's a lot of complexity because um, they kind of have to like compete with others to set orders back onto the order book. Um, And so that essentially kind of like opens up the, the pool of, folks that can provide liquidity. And then the the net effect there is that there's more competitiveness for market making and then deeper liquidity and then more competitive rates. Um, and this is true both for kind of, um, you know, something like Sol on uh, Solana, which, you know, we expect to be like fairly competitive. Um, and then this is also true for long tail tokens, like, you know, for example, a new altcoin on Solana, uh, where, you know, only so many people can provide liquidity. It's really good for builders, actually, in that sense. And I think that's something that is a little bit underappreciated is that a lot of these builders are not market makers and don't have the capacity to market make. But then a token is very useful for them in order to essentially bootstrap their their project. Right. And so they can actually provide like a is essentially the full range of liquidity similar to, uh, you know, an X times Y equals K AMM as well. And have the flexibility to do so and just get that liquidity up and running. And so I think that the flexibility of the model is something that allows for a really good user experience for both these uh, users who are like builders are more casual and like these more advanced traders. Definitely. Market making is a full time job in itself. And I, I think everybody has uh, their hands full enough. So could you speak, Ori, to more of uh, the user design aspect and really how you've kind of tried to tailor it to one like kind of the crypto native but also just like the normal everyday person that's like crypto curious uh that wants to come on chain and try out um orca and your product that you're building and swaps i always say this but i i still laugh that orca actually gets praised so much for its ux even now because i look at this ui that utaro and i cobbled together like you know, in, in our house in Tokyo two years ago. And I'm like, man, this is like crap. Like, I think it could be so much better. You know, we were just kind of, I did some user interviews. I like followed my design process and put something together. But uh, the fact that it was like so well loved to me really just echoed the fact that it was such a low bar in the first place. But I think if we go back to really where it started, uh, what I did was actually just like speak to DeFi users, right? I wasn't one. I had like no knowledge. And I think in some ways that that lack of baggage was really helpful. I just observed what people were doing when they are actually making trades on other platforms, um, whether it was centralized or even like on Uniswap and, you know, made observations like it's really annoying to have to go back and forth to open your MetaMask to check your balances every time. Like, did my trade go through? How long do I have to wait? I'm going to look at the like the block explorer um, or even to like I'm going to cross reference my price across these three different centralized exchanges. 
all these things uh, are, are things that can be solved with technology, right? Like my mantra for design is always that technology should be doing the things that humans don't want to do, right? Humans should do the fun stuff, like actually doing the, the trade um, and not like all this like price referencing. And so I added those things into the original version of Orca, but uh, the new version of Orca that we're going to be launching in a couple of weeks I would say is really the next step in the, like the evolution of that experience. Um, you know, I, I have a lot more experience actually using DeFi, working with people in DeFi, and I think all of those things are going into the the updated version. Perfect. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen some of the teaser stuff that you put out Twitter, and uh, super excited for that to be launching soon. Can you talk about? I mean, a little bit more just. I don't know how much you can or cannot share, but some of the specific improvements on the design aspect that you're really looking forward to. Yeah. So between you and me and everybody listening to this podcast, <laughs> uh, I'd say that the the theme or like I guess the slogan that I picked for, for Orca 2 is I think kind of says it all. Um, and that's it just works. Um, so Orca has like a couple different types of users, right? Uh, there's the folks who are more crypto curious, as you say, there are these very advanced market makers and pro traders, there are builders and the, the new Orca, as, as we like to call it, really does cater, I think, to everyone, but primarily to that more crypto curious user. And I think there's still a lot of things that we as every day, uh, or like people who use crypto every day can forget, can be so confusing to a first time user, like how come this, this transaction doesn't seem to be confirming, right? Like what's happening when it hangs? Do I need to like sign my, my wallet thing again? Like, is there some risk? And so end to end, uh, the new Orca is really supposed to make that simple experience of trading as reliable as possible. And I think that's where like the slogan, it just works comes in because, you know, maybe most of the time, most AMMs or like DEXs will just work, but they don't necessarily work when it really counts, you know, and like when it really counts is when bonk is like going crazy, or, you know, you're really just trying to get a trade through and like the prices are crashing and then you're just like, insert swear word here because I don't know if we're going to bleep that out. But like, you know, that's when it really counts. And so what, I think that's when the new Orca is really there to hold your hand, right? Like, first of all, we've made some like just basic improvements, like refreshing prices more often, making the the actual display of that price refresh way more obvious and adding in these little, I think, like delightful design details. Like there's a progress bar that sort of counts down um, every time you get a quote. And then towards the end of it, the, the bar will turn from like green to yellow to red and the price will start flashing almost like when you're crossing the street and you see the traffic line is like, you better hurry up and get that trade in. Otherwise, we're going to get like a new quote. Um, little things like that. Uh, also just, um, you know, we're actually going to be increasing the, the rate of like refresh for, um, adjusting, like, we're going to be dynamically adjusting rather priority fees. Um, that's something where on most other platforms, users have to manually enter priority fees. And I think this is another example of where like technology should be able to just do this, right? Like, uh, there'll be a function that we can call that gives you the amount of priority fees that you should, uh, theoretically use. And if that doesn't go through, then we can adjust it again under the hood. Um, and then when you actually do complete the transaction, you'll actually be able to see a list of your recent transactions in the interface, which sounds like it should be table stakes for like any trading platform, but it does not seem to exist anywhere in crypto. So it's like yeah. a lot of, a lot of little things that come together to hopefully make things really simple at the end. Definitely. No, I, I think, I mean, I, I always kind of marvel at even the basic stuff that, um, is kind of thrown on the user instead of, as you said, like the technology helping the user at the end of the day. And I, I think from that standpoint, crypto definitely has a long way to go. Um, but <laughs> exciting that you're making those changes. I think, I mean, maybe uh, Utaro is speaking a little bit on like the technical side. I mean, I think um, since Solana has launched, I'm, both of you have seen it go through many ups and downs. And I mean, Solana kind of, kind of having a historic rise similar to ETH in 2017 and round tripped it just like Ethereum all the way back down. But from the networking standpoint, I think it has grown um, pretty vastly under the hood. Um, and one of those being priority fees. Could you talk about, I mean, just some of the network performance upgrades that you've seen over time and how has that actually affected um, Orca itself? Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> 
I think, um, you know, the kind of the quick upgrades uh, and then the, so the quick upgrades in order to kind of um, to replace UDP um, has allowed kind of transaction throughput to um, and transaction kind of completion reliability to, to become a lot better um, when kind of the network is in a relatively stable place. Uh, prioritization fees, there's actually a little bit more infrastructure work that's required on the Solana side. Um, particularly kind of with the 1.14 upgrade that uh, didn't happen <laughs> recently. Um, so, so I think there's a little bit more work that's required on the Solana side in order to get us to a place where, you know, the network can truly be kind of like in a stable place for, for essentially all, um, all network conditions. Um, and if your biggest well, critique or not critique, but thing that you would snap your fingers and could do today or have the Solana foundation implement, what would that be? Yeah. So, I mean, it would definitely be, um, kind of doing more to ensure that there are no network halts. Um, and, and I would also say that there, I don't, I don't have full visibility into what's going on within the Solana, um, kind of engineering team. And so, um, you know, I can't speak kind of, I can't speak with full confidence on like what is going on, but as far as I can tell, you know, for example, what I have seen is that, you know, they're proposing that maybe there could be a grant for um, kind of like testing testnet upgrades uh, so that they can kind of simulate mainnet upgrades more, more accurately. Um, in my opinion, this is probably something that is like so critical that it needs to be done kind of within the core team um, and, and not through grants. Um, you know, for example, I remember with ETH2, um, there, there were some folks kind of like within the Ethereum foundation that were incredibly good at um, kind of battle testing the, the test net um, in order to make sure that the, the upgrade went smoothly. And then ultimately it did. And that was, that was kind of a great thing. Uh, for for Ethereum, I, I think there should be kind of like similar teams within the Solana Foundation that is you know basically full time simulating kind of the main net environment within Testnet and then kind of like battle testing these upgrades and making sure that um, you know if there are any issues, it kind of gets flagged within in Testnet kind of more quickly. I, I kind of think that Solana this next year is going to be quite crucial and you know. It, if it can kind of like make a few upgrades without the network halting, then I think it can turn around the narrative. Otherwise, it's it's going to be kind of quite difficult for 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 Solana to be able to convince others uh, that it's worth kind of you know parking assets on Solana or building on Solana, even if like the technology is actually there. And yeah, I've I've always been envious of Ethereum having multiple clients. Um, and I think once Fire Dancer is live in like Q1 of 2024, Solana will be the second blockchain with multiple clients, which I'm hoping helps reliability quite a bit. But from the outages standpoint, how do you feel like it has either affected the product or team? I mean, obviously, outages suck. Um, and I think the worst thing that they really hamper is the progress of the Solana ecosystem more broadly, um, which, yeah, it, no way to put it besides it sucks. So, and like both of your words, like how has it like either directly impacted the team or the product itself? One thing that's incredibly nice about AMMs is that it truly is fully automated. So then you know, even in the most extreme market conditions or even network calls there, there isn't any kind of additional manual steps that are required. Um, and in that sense, kind of the team itself was isolated. Um, it's more just like, you know, at, at some point we kind of like looked up and we just saw kind of how big of a, a narrative problem these network calls were for the rest of the Solana ecosystem. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think kind of more broadly, you know, we've been thinking about kind of other products to build. And I think one of the things that we've learned is that you know, let's say we want to kind of build maybe kind of a margin trading or like, you know, futures trading you know, that has leverage involved. And then when there's leverage involved, 
uh, network halts become much more serious because there's a risk of liquidations like while the network is halted. Uh, and then thinking about kind of like, is it even possible to kind of fully automate this so that we don't have to stay up all night when the network halts? I think that's kind of a, an interesting kind of thought experiment or just an exercise for the team to go through when designing products. Yeah, I would I would add to that and say outages are never fun. And the impact on Solana has been really tough for, for what Utaro said. But on the other hand, uh, Orca's fared pretty well, I think, throughout all of this. You know, and you mentioned the first breakpoint. At the first breakpoint, it was like crazy bull market conference, but Orca was <laughs> definitely still an underdog. You know, I think the folks who came up to us, actually, I did feel like it was such a magical experience when people came up and they're like, oh, I love Orca, like so inspired. I use it to top my, teach my dad how to crypto or whatever. And I was like, that still felt pretty unique because like Orca was not the, the major player, I think, in the ecosystem. And, you know, what Orca has done is survive all of these, uh, whether it's downtime or outages or, you know, certain notable organizations collapsing um, and come out actually with like a larger market share. And I think that is a testament to like the hard work that's been done on the product front, but also I think like the BD front, the the marketing front, and really just building a product and a protocol that people trust, even in a time when trust is really hard to find. Definitely. Yeah. No. And I think, yeah, I mean, even at the event that I attended, I think there was less than 50 people uh, at the first breakpoint event for Orca. And so um, I think you purposely kept it small, but it was a tight knit community and um, it, it was cool to be there. And um, it's amazing just how much you have grown. And I think just being in crypto since 2017, uh, there's remarkable um, kind of success by just surviving in itself and continuing to iterate on the product, uh, continuing to make things more simplistic from the user experience, continuing to add more reliability in, in these trustless systems, building trust with your communities and users. So I applaud both of you and the team for ultimately uh, the roller coaster that you've been on. It's not easy. Same to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on, on that front, I mean, so you're doing kind of the UI refresh and then you, I believe, have another product ultimately coming up, uh, Orca Pro. Uh, could you share a little bit more about that as well? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, we'd love to talk about that. So <clears throat> I think for now, Orca Pro is what we're calling it internally. Um, not really sure what we're going to ultimately call it externally. The branding team is working <clears throat> on it. Small, Perfect. small team. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, you know, basically kind of we were looking at the the market making experience for our concentrated liquidity AMM and you know, thinking about it, talking to users. One thing we realized is that kind of the interface that we the the experience that we have for market making uh, on our concentrated liquidity AMM, it it is basically kind of a an iteration of the original kind of LP interface for the classical AMM. And what we realize is that that is not kind of the ideal, that is not the right interface for kind of concentrated liquidity AMMs. The main reason is that, you know, essentially kind of a concentrated liquidity AMM is much more similar to a, a central limit order book. And so, you know, there are kind of these, these things that are, um, you know, basically kind of information and user flows uh, that, kind of folks have figured out for an ideal interface for our central limit order books that are like very appropriate for, for our kind of uh, concentrated liquidity AMM as well. I mean, one thing very simply is a price chart. Um, you know, price chart is kind of very necessary because you're always going to be providing liquidity within a range and you want to know kind of like what is, what is kind of the, the price history um, you know, on different time frames for the liquidity that you're trying to provide. Another one is kind of like more simply looking at the liquidity depth. Um, yeah. So, you know, with an order book, <clears throat> you always see kind of like the order book depth. And a lot of times you actually see like two different views, right? Like one where it's kind of like vertically stacked and another one where it's kind of like horizontally aligned. Um, but those, those interfaces are incredibly important as well. And then finally, <clears throat> um, a better view of kind of um, expected return 
like expected fees earned essentially. Um, you know, this is something that kind of is more unique to AMMs that don't, that doesn't necessarily exist in order books. But, you know, even if you look at kind of Binance, for example, they have kind of tools for backtesting different strategies. I think those kinds of things are incredibly important for market making on a concentrated liquidity AMM as well. Um, so we want to like <clears throat> take all those things together and then <clears throat> kind of, you know, rebuild the interface for market making um, and do it in a way, sorry. <clears throat> and basically just like rebuild the, the interface kind of with our better, like our kind of improved understanding of, you know, what market makers actually care about. Makes a lot of sense. I think, yeah, I mean, AMMs were really kind of birthed in the the crypto ecosystem and the design, as you mentioned, has kind of stayed relatively same, but there is a lot more information under the hood that you could be providing. And by bringing that to the forefront combined with like the special features that AMMs provide, uh, can be very powerful when all kind of surface together. And I think that ultimately that ties back to the user experience and really making crypto more simple. I think I always look at uh, or try as much as possible to look at like user metrics um, and even some of the more popular applications in all of crypto only have a couple million users. And so I'm very excited for the day when we have tens of millions and then hundreds of millions. Um, I'm optimistic that we'll be on Solana just because the architecture is, um, I think, very unique. Um, but uh, by building these tools, by creating the better uh, uh, user interface, I, I think Orca is fairly well positioned to capture a lot of that. Yeah, I'm I'm personally really excited for this because I think it's a pretty radical reframing of, of what's out there, right? I think uh, the concentrated liquidity AMM in particular is one where the existing interfaces very much adhere to the let's just take the underlying data models and spit them on the screen mentality of design. And like, you know, even Orca's current design, I would say, is, is guilty of that. And so I think this is a really great opportunity to integrate all of that, to create an interface that is designed for what we now have a much better understanding of is the target user and already matches their existing workflow, right? So again, instead of like going off onto a different site to like look at the candlesticks and like to draw your lines and like all of that is should be available right there in the interface. Uh, but even before you get there, like Orca should be helping you identify these undercapitalized pools that have a really high ratio of fees to liquidity and also have that sort of crab-like movement that you're looking for, right, when you're a clam LP. And so I think all of those steps should be provided by the interface, like be able to identify these pools, get in there, click and drag for the, the actual range that you want, see the liquidity depth within that range for each different fee tier, and then make an informed decision from there on how much liquidity to put in to the pool and to be able to, to track that more easily. All of those things are, I, you know, I won't say that we have like a 100% defined spec for this future product, uh, but things that we're, we're thinking about when it comes to how to improve the experience. Any teasers on uh, an MVP that will be launched uh, on mainnet? I mean, I think at the very minimum, you will definitely find those those candlesticks that like click and drag behavior, uh, a more integrated liquidity depth chart that is easier to read. Uh, and I think also a more intuitive experience and a simpler experience for, for repositioning, which is a huge pain point for LPs right now. I think repositioning, I don't even really think of it as the right way of thinking about it anymore. I think of it as essentially like editing an existing position or I guess like editing essentially your orders if it was an order book um, to be able to adjust not only the, the range, but also the, the amount of liquidity kind of all in one go and in a very simple interface that takes just, you know, one or two clicks as opposed to the probably five or six clicks that it takes on Orca today. And that will be in a month, two months? <laughs> as soon yeah. as possible. I think, uh, no, never ask engineers for uh, yeah. time estimates. <laughs> yeah. I usually 3x whatever estimate comes out of any engineer. So. <laughs> I, I've never gotten an estimate right. So, yeah, I'm not even going to bother. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they're, they're tough. yeah, I mean, you know, this is a, a bit of a kind of tangent, but, you know, I, I remember one of the narratives from a few years ago was that, hey, in TradFi, um, kind of, 
the ultimately kind of the the um, the model that got you know all the adoption was the central limit order book model, and therefore it makes like maybe that's kind of a signal that that is kind of the the best way to create markets, and therefore we should do that on a that would be the case on a blockchain as well. <clears throat> I, I actually suspect, and you know, to a certain degree, this is a counterfactual that can never really be proven. But I suspect that kind of a concentrated liquidity AMM type construction, even off of a blockchain, but you know, in like centralized servers, could actually be quite quite good, um, and, and could actually be like quite competitive with like the traditional order book model. Um, and, and I think a lot of that might be just due to the fact that um, market making becomes a lot more competitive and, you know, essentially kind of more people will be able to do market making. If you kind of look at like, you know, who is actually market making um, in, in, in TradFi for like U.S. equities, for example, it's actually a, a very small set of kind of, um, you know, highly, highly skilled, highly specialized professionals in like a few geographic le- regions. Um, and, and, and maybe like that, I think kind of like the mainline narrative is that that's the case because it's so competitive, but maybe actually the reason why is because like the barrier to entry is high, um, and, and it's actually kind of, um, not as competitive as like people make it out to be. I think if you want the controversial two word soundbite for why is a clam better than a clob, it's deeper liquidity. Interesting. I love it. On on that like point of view, I mean, uh, could you break apart like how you kind of think about your audience and users today? Um, one from like an actual user of the product, and then a person, or an LP providing liquidity. Uh, are there any like specific buckets that you think about people and how they use your products? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, essentially, kind of. Very simplistically, the user base right now are folks that are active on chain um, that just want to kind of trade one token for another. Um, you know, we see we see uh, kind of the majority of trades, um, you know, actual kind of like user trades being between Seoul and USDC. But then in addition, you know, we see kind of Maybe I'm just going to throw out a number. I don't know how accurate it is, but I think like roughly 30% of trades are altcoins, right? So right now, um, Bonk uh, and uh, I believe RLB are like kind of two fairly popular tokens that a lot of people are trying to trade. And, and, and so essentially, it's just like folks that are, on, that are active on chain that kind of want to, you know, s- swap these tokens one for another. Um, when it comes to kind of like the difference between folks that are trading and folks that are market making, I think one conversation I had with someone at Jump that I thought was like quite illuminating for me is that at the end of the day, kind of um, market making and you know actively kind of like swapping one token for another, these are both trades, right? Like as in every single trade <clears throat> has like the active trader and then the market maker, and they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So it's not, it it can sometimes be useful to think of them as like two separate folks or like two, two different, uh, two different categories of users. But a lot of times there's kind of like significant overlap between the two. Um, and, and one way of thinking about it is like traders are those that kind of want to take a directional position and then market makers are folks that for the most part kind of, um, think that there's kind of at least like a temporary correlation between the two and that there's going to be, you know, what folks call like a crab market, <clears throat> but that could be kind of like in the five minute time frame or a one day time frame, a one week time frame or a one year time frame, right? It's kind of up to the market maker um, how long they, they kind of, w- how long uh, they want the time frame to be, uh, you know, for their, for their own actions. And there's builders as well, right? I think as a, another segment of users, users of the protocol overall, I would say also even kind of two subcategories of builders. One is essentially projects that just want to bootstrap liquidity. Um, and others are using Orca's SDK to actually build stuff on top of Orca. And I think that that part gets me personally like a little bit nerdily excited because then we're starting to think about use cases in which users may not even really know that they're trading on a blockchain. I think that's kind of the long term of where 
crypto needs to get to to succeed is like these real world use cases that in turn for, for Orca translate to this like somewhat price insensitive retail trading volume and kind of make the flywheel turn, right? But I think we started to see a little bit of this last year with uh, Step In integrating Orca. And for the first time, you know, I had friends like in Japan who were like, oh, I'm using this like Step In thing and I'm making money by walking. Like, how cool. I was like, <laughs> Do you, did you know that you're actually using Orca under the hood? And they're like, what? Uh, you know, it, it was an early case, but I think cases like that are super exciting. And, and you know, for, for crypto takeoff, you know, I'm knocking on wood. Hopefully we'll see more and more of those. On that front, I mean... So I, I feel like we had Samo um, in this cycle. We had Bonk and also Stepin. And each of those, could you maybe like, I mean, you don't have to speak, speak to anyone specifically, but like overall, like how some of those virality like brought in either users or people into the ecosystem um, and maybe even some of the surprises that you learned from some of those big moments. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can talk about step in because I think that one was one of the more interesting ones. Uh, one of one of the big reasons why it's so interesting is because the user base that was actually using kind of step in and you know doing the swaps between let's say USDC and GMT or USDC and GST, it was so kind of separate from the rest of the Orca user base. So we kind of saw the volume increasing, but then we weren't actually seeing any or a whole lot of chatter on like Twitter or even on Discord because well, they, they didn't even know the users. They don't. They don't. They're not on crypto Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What a shock! Yeah, and um, that's what I thought. Apple Watch is trying to contribute to this this podcast, right? Now. Uh, Siri always has to uh, jump in on podcasts. It's mandatory. Yeah, it's. Bad Siri. Um, anyways, uh, yeah. So that was that was incredibly interesting, and you know, at least I, th- I think for both of us, we we didn't even really understand what Stepin was until kind of it was doing ridiculous numbers, and it kind of forced us to look further into um, kind of what was going on. But I, I suppose that's also kind of one of the really um, that's kind of one of the strengths of kind of our product. It truly is automated, so we don't even really. Um, you know, we aren't actually the gatekeepers. You know, a lot of folks ask, like, how did kind of, uh, you know, how did Stefan end up on Orca? Well, we didn't actually, us, at least the two of us, didn't do anything. Uh, there were some, you know, great folks on the Solana Foundation side and RPD side that kind of uh, made things happen. For the, But for the most part, it's like everything is truly permissionless. You know, well, I think you're underselling Orca's developers. Like, they are actually the real champs here. <clears throat> like, people like Meep and Scuba. Obviously, real yeah. names here. But, you know, people who I think took this approach of human centered design and apply it to developer experience. And when people ask, you know, how do you get people to use Orca? Like, build, how do you get builders to use Orca? I think it's like developer experience is user experience. Developers are users. And it's about giving them interfaces that make sense. It's really not so different from like looking at a UI and understanding how to use it. You want to look at the function names and instantly know how to use something. You want to provide utilities in like the languages and in the frameworks that people are already using. And Orca has some really brilliant developers who just treat this as an art, you know, as a craft to, to get really nerdy about making sure that devs have the right tools available. And that's actually why I still want to advocate it for the integration. And on that front, I mean, maybe going back to speaking to the SDK that you developed and some of the things that you've been working um, under the hood on that. Yeah. So, you know, we've been incredibly fortunate with kind of our our engineering team. And for example, Meep, who is one of our engineers, um, he he came from essentially kind of like a FANG background um, and you know, essentially, I, I'm sure you're familiar, but like a lot of these Fang engineers, they're just like hammered in like kind of certain disciplines in them like over and over and over again. And, and I think he he's like a pretty good embodiment of that. Um, but when he joined, he basically just like took over the SDK, um, you know, put a lot of effort into making sure that kind of like the public interface was easy to consume, easy to use. And we got so much great feedback kind of from all these developers about how easy it was for the Orca SDK to use. Um, Yeah. I mean, on that, I think smart router is actually like a really interesting thing to talk about as something that, 
is a huge like technical innovation, but also something that uh, helps improve the, the UI side. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, that's another one where kind of ultimately just uh, there's no silver bullet. You know, we kind of it's just uh, a lot of hard work on the engineering side. Uh, but recently, we upgraded the the routing mechanism for for the swap interface, um, and essentially we have like a, a a nearly optimal kind of uh, routing algorithm that can both kind of hop over multiple legs, uh, but can also like split trades in order split kind of like larger trades, um, and and essentially kind of it, it was just. It was just a computer engineering problem because um, we wanted kind of the route calculation to happen on the client side. Um, that required us to be able to like fetch all the accounts that are required to calculate, you know, the best route efficiently. Uh, that in- required both like kind of batching the network requests, uh, and then there's also just so many details involved. Like for example, um, kind of calculating the PDAs in Solana actually turns out to be fairly non-trivial um, because, you know, you kind of have to do multiple hashes in order to discover the PDA. Um, and so what we realized is that actually, you know, at a certain scale, we need to to kind of like prefetch the PDAs and then cache them as well if we want mm-hmm. the user experience to be um, kind of quite responsive. So we put in all this work uh, in order to make that happen. And then I think... Um, yeah, we, we we did a soft launch essentially of our new router mechanism, but it's something that you know I'm incredibly proud of uh, that the engineering team did, and just like uh, I basically tell everyone, kind of like um, kind of you know to try it out and just compare it with like kind of other existing uh, you know routers on the Solana ecosystem because ours is definitely kind of like best in class at the moment. And the rates are actually better than what we're seeing on some aggregators right now up to like 30, 40% of the time. And then within like a very, very narrow range, another like 50, 60% of the time in our current tests. So I think that kind of speaks to the, the algorithmic efficiency of this. And it, I think it's just beautiful. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, often when I swap, I will look at different places and just to kind of double check if I'm doing a larger order and I, um, and I'm always pleasantly surprised that Orca is uh, normally number one. Um, and so it makes it kind of easy and ultimately um, helpful for me just because over time, <laughs> I don't want to look at very many places because I know Orca is typically going to be the best place for um, for my swaps. So definitely appreciate all the work that you and the team have done there. Maybe kind of like closing the podcast or wrapping it up. What are like, I mean... Obviously, you have a couple product launches. You're, you're revamping the UI, really making things much easier um, from the user perspective for LPs. What are you specifically excited for? One, I would say, like outside of those two things, for either the Orca team or the ecosystem going forward in 2023. The other thing that I'm really excited about, and I think a lot of Orca users actually don't know about, is Orca's impact initiatives, which think have always been part of the protocol and kind of stem back to that background that I mentioned of always trying to work in goody two shoes fields. Um, but one is actually the, the big um, donation that Orca made of almost a million dollars last year through the Orcanauts NFT sale. And that actually founded a, or funded rather, a partnership with the NGO Afflatoon, which is focused on financial literacy for youth, specifically helping them develop a digital currency and cryptocurrency literacy curriculum in regions of the world where uh, this knowledge is badly needed. And so that includes Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the first pilot programs are actually happening right now, uh, training the the instructors who will be teaching these. So I think that's super exciting. Uh, And the second is actually something that's ongoing even now. So every time that anyone makes a trade on Orca, some portion of that goes towards the the climate fund, uh, which has actually raised like over $1.4 million to date, still kind of mind boggling to me and is administered by a decentralized working group of Orca, which is mainly folks from sustainability backgrounds who steward these funds and make sure that they go to like the right uh, organizations that can make the most impact. So already 550,000 has been donated to the Ocean Conservancy. And now the, the working group um, has allocated more to go to different small um, grants 
that people can use for basically climate change focused initiatives. So I think that's something where I'm really excited, where the more we work on ORCA, the more that ORCA scales and the more that this impact also scales. Amazing. I, I didn't realize uh, the ORCA team has raised so much money uh, for this. Uh, so very cool to hear. I'd say it's the protocol. It's not the team. Yeah, it's like yeah, pr- purely funded by, by users. And I think that's the really magical thing is the more Orca scales, the more this impact scales. Amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, maybe if I can just like mention, I think, I think a few things kind of one is <clears throat> I'm excited to see kind of like the development and the development of like additional financial primitives. Like I think that for um, kind of the exchange of fungible tokens, a concentrated liquidity AMM is essentially kind of like <clears throat> the theoretical optimum. Like we're not going to see, we're not going to see, I could be wrong on this, but I, I, I suspect that we're actually not going to see kind of like radical design changes uh, from here on out. Uh, <clears throat> however, I, I think there's actually a lot of room for improvement for other financial primitives. Like for example, one is um, kind of like futures exchanges. I, I suspect that kind of, there is no kind of quite there, there's quite uh, or there's no design yet that is kind of quite really good that everyone can kind of say, hey, like this is kind of like, you know, how people should design kind of futures exchanges that are decentralized. Um, I think another one that I'm excited for and I think Ori's going to laugh at this, but um, um. yeah, I, I suspect that I like kind of looking at kind of uh, how how intelligent um, kind of things like Copilot and GPT-4 are for kind of generating code and thinking about kind of like, you know, essentially kind of the the changes to software development that we can expect to see, even if like LLMs themselves don't kind of increase in capability, but we just kind of build better kind of like tooling around it. Um, You know, I I suspect that um, we'll see kind of like disproportionate impact in the crypto space because the crypto space is so young and kind of it's still like relatively dynamic and we'll be able to see adoption of these new like software development processes um, in crypto more so than kind of other other industries. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, great retake, uh, great podcast and no, truly appreciate you taking a chance on Solana. Uh, appreciate you uh, having the human-centered design. Uh, appreciate you building DeFi uh, in this ecosystem and excited for what's to come with your new product launches um, and very excited for ultimately for you to help bring in more users into the ecosystem. So thank you for everything that you've done and thank you to the team and what you've built. Thanks so much. Yeah, really appreciate you taking all the time to highlight people doing impactful work in this space because that's a huge part of it as well. So honestly, appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. trying to hi- highlight the builders who are building the ecosystem. I think there's a lot of noise, and uh, they're the ones whose voices should be uh, listened to more. So yeah, uh, thank you again. <laughs>